this, the fourth Sunday in Advent, is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, let a man so account us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now here is it required in stewards that a man be found trustworthy. But with me it is a very small matter to be judged by you or by man's tribunal. Nay, I do not even judge my own self. For I have nothing on my conscience, yet I am not thereby justified. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, Pass no judgment before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and make manifest the counsels of hearts, and then everyone will have his praise from God and the Holy Gospel. It's taken from St. Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was procurator of Judea, and Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother Tetrarch of the district of Eturian Trachonitis, and the son is Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zachary, in the desert. And he went into all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the desert, make ready the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked ways shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth, and all mankind shall see the salvation of God. Thus for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. My beloved people, I again draw your attention to the announcements that are in today's bulletin, that you will pay very close attention to them. Also, which is not in the bulletin, two things. First thing is that uh, during the days to come, of course, uh, we do keep the church locked, and all of you know the reasons why. And anyone who comes here, please know that you and any visitors that you may have are totally welcome and all that you have to do is come over to the monastery and ring the doorbell, and we will be more than happy to take and let you in the church. But we are not quite sure that we won't leave the church completely unguarded and unlocked during these days especially. I want to read a little something that I put together actually which was taken, has been taken, from the divine office that is recited by the monks. And this was recited only this morning as the monks prayed their divine office. Sound the trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is nigh. Behold, he will come to save us. Behold, the desire of all nations shall come, and the house of the Lord shall be filled with glory. The Lord will come. Go ye out to meet him. Fear not, for our Lord shall come to you. Behold, all things are fulfilled. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is what we prayed and said this morning in this church, the monks and the nuns. And I take something out of today's bulletin so that it will not escape anybody's attention. 
because on such an occasion as Christmas, the word peace is very often heard. Therefore, in the thought to remember today's bulletin, I read the following, or we read the following. Peace is a heaven-given gift and is given only to men of good will. It is impossible for peace to enter into the heart of any man whose will is not good are well disposed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Ghost, Amen. We read very much, and we hear very much, the following also on such occasions as Christmas. Glory to God, uh, peace and goodwill to men. Peace and goodwill and now, happy holidays to men. In other words, what we're looking for and what we expect is a happy holiday mood where everybody is going around having a lot of fun and a lot of this and a lot of that and a lot of the other. That's not what the angels said. That's not at all what the angels said. They said something was quite different. They rearranged the words for that matter. No, no, we rearranged their words. This is what the angels said. I have to read it because I get it mixed up every time I try this. Glory to God on the highest and on earth peace to men of good will. I said a moment ago that it is impossible for peace to enter into the heart of any man whose will is not good. Because that man has closed his door, he slammed it shut, and nothing and nobody can enter in the heart of that man. Christmas is a day of joy, is a day of peace of hope and serenity. For a long time now, and especially now, especially now, Christmas is the saddest day of the entire year. And there are more suicides on Christmas Day than any other day of the year. Why is that? Why is that the case? As you might expect, we get many telephone calls. As a matter of fact, I had a telephone call just a few minutes ago. From a precious, blessed lady, an elderly person, away from here, far away from here, that we know quite well. Father, Father, what is happening? What is it all around us? Why are we all so disturbed? Where is
is the peace that we speak so much of? I don't see it. We don't see it. Where is it? We have everything, don't we? We have absolutely everything that money can buy. There's nothing left for us to seek after except the trouble of going to the store and taking out a credit card and buying the moon. And we take the moon home with us in a package, in a box, in a sack, in a plastic bag. And we wrap it up, make it pretty. For the rest of the horde to come in on Christmas Day and literally wreck the place. And we open up that box with the moon in it. And we think we've got everything, but we look at it and say, okay, so what, what's next? Next box, please. Never satisfied. Never will be satisfied because we are not looking for that which we are supposed to have. Peace is a gift of Almighty God, a, a gift of heaven, a gift that is brought down to us by the angels, a gift for us to have. And yet, when we go home, and in the privacy of our homes, when all the doors are closed and the windows are barred and the shades are down and nobody can see us, none of our friends or neighbors or relatives or anybody, and our true selves come out. And what do we see? Is this what was intended by God? You know, I think sometimes that we give the poor little innkeeper a hard time in that he shut the door in God's face and would not let him in the inn. He was merely doing what God wanted him to do. Can we imagine, even with the most vivid of imagination, can we imagine Jesus Christ being born and presented to us in a holiday convention style situation where everybody was... Mm -hmm. Probably some of them were feeling pretty good. You know? Very jolly, happy, noisy, jumpy, and everything. Can you imagine Mary giving birth to Jesus Christ in a place like that? Rather, place for Jesus Christ to be born. The only logical place for Jesus Christ to be born was where he was born. In a stable, dirty, filthy, earthy, and certainly not at all attractive to anybody but alone God. Because with God there is no distinction between a shaky stable and the palace of a king. That was the only 
probable, likely place for Christ to touch earth at. The trouble with too many of us is, my beloved people, that we just don't understand God. Of course, we don't know the world, probably, until we get to heaven. How often have I pointed out to you that the serpent is going to soon come and swish his tail another time and a final time to come and pick up the scraps. Have you not even heard the swish of his tail? It's there. Listen. Simply listen and you will hear it. And too many of us, God forbid, too many of us will be swept up and we will not know exactly the reason why. We will not care for that matter. Today, I think it would be safe and in, in place and in, in proper to say, Who is it in this room right now, as I say always, so often, as a reminder, who is it in this room right now that does not have somebody to be dreadfully worried about? That poor lady that called this morning was very worried about her son, you know? About her son. Who is it that does not have a son, or a daughter, or a mother, or a father, or a husband, or a wife, or an uncle, or an aunt, or a nephew, or a niece, or whoever, 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 or a next door neighbor, or anybody at all? It's not worried, worried, and scared. Please pray for the conversion of my son, of my daughter, or whoever. Please pray. I'm so worried that my son is going to hell, that my daughter is going to hell. Is this proper talk for Christmas? Of course it is. Yes, it is. That's why he came here to keep that from happening, did he not? What do, must we do? Yes, pray. That we go to our son, or our daughter, or our friend, or our neighbor, or our brother, or sister, or whoever, and start preaching, no. Start bringing them books? No. Start arguing with them? No. Debating? Of course not. Then what shall we do? The only thing that we can give, of course, other than prayer, is our own good example. What kind of example are we giving anybody that looks upon us? And how consistent are we in our good example? Hot one day and absolutely unknown and unknowable the next day. What kind of example do we give to those who look upon us? And they hear us preach the word of God. 
while we go about doing as we pretty well happily feel like doing. My beloved people, Christmas is serious. It is the center point of everything. It's in today's bulletin when we speak of the Incarnation. The Incarnation is at the center of everything known to man. And we do not comprehend that. And we walk away from it. Lest perhaps we see. When we go about trying to do what we want to do, even in our holy religion, my beloved people, I speak not to us, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. I speak not to us, hopefully, that we go about picking and choosing a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit some other place, and bring it all together and say, this is our holy religion. No, 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 no. How many times have I asked the question or said, please do not come here because you prefer this to that. That's not why we come here. That's not why I and the monks and the nuns here, that's what not, not I stand here at this moment. I could find a merrier place and a happier place and a more jollier place where I could do as I pretty well please and as I twist things around and I've got nobody to worry about. It is not there. You will also read in today's bulletin something about will. A man's will. Has it ever occurred to you that even God, the omnipotent creator, the one who created all of the suns and the moon and the stars and all the planets and all the things you see upon earth, the wind and the storm and the rain and the ice and the heat, the, man, the one who created everything. Everything answers to him. Everything. The mountains, the hills, the birds, everything answers to him. Except one. And he cannot conquer that. Guess what that is? me, my will, he cannot touch it, I have more power than the God who created all things, I've got more power, and I certainly enjoy my power as I do just as I well please to do. And all that God can do is look. That's all he can do. Because I want it this way. And the trouble with you, God, is that you just don't understand. And you are behind times, God. Don't forget that. Please, God, keep that in mind. You are not with it. Please keep your place. And you take care of yours. And I'll, take, and I'll keep my place, and I'll take care of mine. 
stay, keep away from me, God. But be sure, Lord, I love you. Don't forget that, Lord, I love you. As I do what I wish to do. And rearrange things. Oh my goodness gracious. In this problem of in this question, in this project of rearranging things, that we are the smartest people that ever were in rearranging, changing things, manipulating, you know, turning things around. Christmas is for peace. And there can only be one way to have that peace. And that is to do what peace calls upon us to do. It is the foundation of everything. Last Sunday, if you recall, I likened us to a building, a tall building, a multi-story building, a skyscraper, each floor of that building being a virtue to be obtained. Each that building being the project for me to become like unto my God and to reach the perfection of God as best I can as a human. And he is at the top floor of that building. Let's go to our imagination again. Suppose that some place along the way, pick out any floor you want to just make a particle of difference, and just simply take a knife and cut out one floor. Just do away with it. It doesn't exist. No girders, no bricks, no mortar, no windows, no nothing. Just cut it out like a piece of pie and do away with it. Peace is on that floor. Can the rest of the building stand up with one floor completely gone? The building will crash and there is no other way to say it. And we've got to be strong enough and understanding enough to know that that is the way it goes. We cannot expect God to come and hold the building up for me and let me go my merry way and do whatever I want to, whenever I want to, in the way I want to. Not at all. St. John the Baptist said repentance. Who hears repentance? Everybody says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You hear that all along. They said that on the football. Oh, pardon, I didn't mean that. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Doesn't it more mean anything than a pitch of salt in the ocean? What does sorrow mean if we mean what we say? It means change. It means repentance. It means consistency, constant, constant, and not be, as Shakespeare says, as inconstant as the moon. Every time you look at the moon, it's different, isn't it? I repeat that for emphasis. Every time we look at the moon, it's different. It doesn't look like it looked last night. Nor will it look, nor does it look like the way it will look tomorrow night. Am I that way with my moods? The people do not really know what to expect of me the next time they see me. And yet, I'm at peace wherever I am. 
No, it's not going to work. If we want peace, we have got to give. We have got to present. We've got to bring calm to our family. We've got to bring calm to all who come to interview with us. That is where peace is. And we have to understand it. And we have to understand it real good. My beloved precious people, I've also said to you, no, I'm not going to be so brash as to say that we are automatically of the elect of God. I would like to think that, but I could not be so brash as to announce something like that. I would like for that to be us, but I will say that this much, that if we, if we, do not at least approach by our own sentiments, by our own goodwill, by our own intention, and so forth, our own desire. If we do not at least give God a smidgen of goodwill and most likely his elect, most likely his elect, most likely his elect, if they can't find it in us, where on earth is he going to find it? Peace to men, women, children, uncles, and aunts, and everybody of goodwill. You know well enough that you and all you love most will be in our prayers, are in our prayers, especially at this time, and that it is the hope and the prayer and the desire of all the monks, all the nuns, and myself, to wish you a beautiful Christmas, a happy Christmas, a joyful Christmas, a holy Christmas, a blessed Christmas, a peaceful Christmas. I don't give two hoots for the happy holiday business. This is not a holiday, it's a holy day. And the sooner we keep that in mind, the better everybody will be. Tomorrow night, the church will be open at whatever convenient time you arrive. Tomorrow is a vigil of Christmas. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a day of fast and abstinence. It's a difficult day to maintain a good fast and a good abstinence. Everybody realizes that. We know that. We try the best you can, at least in spirit, to keep a fast and an abstinence. And we did not have room to put it in the bulletin, but our Father Michael will read the Christmas proclamation in the church tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, you come to church to give praise to God. And the only reason why you or me or anybody comes through those doors is to give him praise and honor and glory the way he wants praise and honor and glory. Blessed and holy people, this morning we're going to bless bread. When you take this bread home with you,
please do what you have been asked to do. It is not an empty ceremony. It is not just something cute and lovely for the children to see. It is something that requires strength stronger than what most of us have. It is real, it is serious, and it is important. And we give example to our children and show them where it is. And we come to God, and, and, and when you break that bread, fathers or mothers, when you break that bread, if you do not have that ingredient that is called upon at this time, then I don't really know what to say. I don't know. And I hope and pray that each one of us will have that ingredient as we extend our arm in peace, in hope, in joy, and in complete truth. Truth, my beloved people, truth, the truth of Almighty God, not something manufactured or concocted or put together or rewritten a rearranged verbal a word order, whatever, but the truth that has been handed to us by those of us who've come before us and who have placed it in our hands and in our hearts to hold and to keep forever. Amen. If you will please kneel, I will give you the blessing that I have for you to take home with you and to keep and to enjoy. <laughs>